One of the things we wanted to experiment this year is with debates. And both Dr. Wasserheit, who is our exceptionally overworked chair, uh, who will thankfully continue go on to be our past president, past chair, chair emeritus, thankfully Judy is staying on, uh, and also Dr. Tom Quinn, who is one of our ex exceptional board members that we have and representing NIH, who uh, have really been a great partner with us. I want to thank uh, Dr. Roger Glass and Dr. Josh Rosenthal, who are here, who have really done a phenomenal job in ensuring that NIH has a great footprint at this conference. So one of the things that came up in the brainstorming was, why don't we have a debate, and why don't we have a debate on some compelling challenges with some amazing speakers and facilitators? So we're really lucky today to have one of our board chairs, Dr. Pierre Buchans, who is going to be our vice chair next year for his sins. He's taking over from Tim Brewer. And uh, we have two extraordinary speakers here, Dr. Nelson Simon Combo, who is the principal from Makariri University in Uganda and also the head of the National Academy of Sciences in Uganda, and also Dr. Richard Horton. Dr. Horton is the editor of The Lancet, as all of you know, and I have to say that both Richard and Zoe Mullen, who is the editor of The Lancet Global Health, we owe them an exceptional debt of gratitude because they have not only provided the incredible booklet that you have with the top abstracts uh, that we have uh, at this conference, but they're also putting all of the abstracts online, and uh, they have given us incredible support with the Lancet Global, Lancet CUGH, CUGH Poster Awards, which will, as was mentioned earlier, be during our business meeting. So without much further ado, on time and under budget, we have, ladies and gentlemen, our first debate. Thank you, thank you, Keith, and uh, thank you, Nelson, and thank you, Richard, for being here. These two gentlemen have extreme views, and uh, I'm here to kind of uh, make sure that uh, this remains a peaceful debate. Uh, they, uh, they believe that uh, uh, everything we do in global health uh, has actually um, uh, a lot of effects that uh, we don't think about. Um, Richard strongly believes that um, we are actually not helping low and middle income countries, that we are only helping ourselves in the north, and uh, he will make a case for that. So on my left, an extreme position, we are actually completely selfish, and we are using uh, all the money we have in global health to help uh, the US, Europe, and other countries from the north, just pretending that we're helping low and middle income countries. And then uh, Nelson actually wanted to sit on that side too, but I forced him <laughs> to sit here uh, and, and to pretend that he strongly believes that uh, actually everything we do is really helping low and middle income countries. And then if we take small IDCs and overheads, it's just because we have to. So you have these two views. Now, we're going to start with a pretest. So pay a lot of attention. There will be a pretest and a post-test. So you're going to vote. And I'm originally from Belgium, where voting is compulsory, and there is a 200 euros fine if you don't. <laughs> so if you believe that actually you don't have to be that, that extreme, you know, but if you believe that uh, we are actually helping the global north more than we think, then please raise your hand if you think that we're helping the global north more than the global south. Okay. Did you vote? <laughs> you're, not, you're not supposed to. Thank you. Now, if you're thinking that actually, on balance, we're really helping low and middle income countries more than the global north, please raise your hand. Okay. If you abstain, abstentions, no abstentions? Okay. And if you, didn't, if you didn't vote, go to the registration desk and write your check, yes. 
All right, thank you. That's actually very helpful. So let me start by asking Richard in no more than seven minutes to make his case. Thank you, Pierre. Friends, <laughs> this is a debate that I want to lose. So please, I urge you, do not vote for anything I say. Vote for my opponent, Professor Nelson Sowen Cambo. There are many wonderful examples of the benefits of global health in low and middle income countries settings. And most, in fact, all of you represent those wonderful examples. But the problem that you have, the problem that puts Nelson in such an impossible position, the problem, the problem that means you will have to vote for me is that the totality of the evidence on this question is overwhelmingly in my favor. In the case for the prosecution, I am your Exhibit A. Look no further than this week's issue of The Lancet, and apologies for all those I'm about to offend. But it is a, it is a scar on the imperial face of global health. Let me take three examples from this week's issue. A fantastic paper on non-partner sexual violence. The authors did a remarkable thing. They systematically reviewed over 7,000 studies across 56 countries. What an astonishing opportunity to bring together scientists, civil society advocates, policymakers from those 56 countries. So did they? Hell did they. They did not. There were seven authors from Geneva, guess where in Geneva? London, Gothenburg, and Cape Town. But we had the chance of fixing that bias because we commissioned an editorial to go with that piece. We could choose somebody from the Global South. So did we? Yes, we did. They were from the South. From Atlanta. <laughs> we also published a brilliant editorial on global child mortality and child rights. Where did those five authors come from? Guess where they came from? Did they come from one of the 75 priority countries from the UN Secretary General's Every Woman, Every Child strategy? Well, if New York is one of the primary <laughs> priority countries for under five child mortality, yes! So no. <laughs> and finally, in a review of a book about reimagining the future of global health, we invited a researcher from, guess where? London to write about those fantastic people leading the reimagining of global health. And guess where they're from? Boston. <laughs> so let me ask you three questions. First, global health is our passion. It's our vision. It's our belief. But tell me, how many departments of global health do you know of in the global south? Fewer than in the global north, I think. Global health today is a discipline of the global north, much more than it is of this eponymously entitled global south. It's that we have to change. Vote against it. Vote for this motion. Second, which universities in the global north go to the global south? We have a lot of our universities that are establishing, creating campuses with their names on them in the Global South. I won't embarrass any university or funder by naming those universities. You know who they are. <laughs> the creation of satellite campuses in other countries is not a signal of Global Health commitment, gl the Global North's commitment to the Global South. It is part of the international business strategy of our modern Western universities to expand your markets for education and research. Stop this. Vote against it. Vote for the motion. Third, why do our multilateral global health institutions consistently fail to hold the powerful accountable for their gross violations of human rights? Because in an astonishing betrayal, 
They plead that they are intergovernmental institutions and can only ever respond to the direct requests of member states. Come on, don't be fooled. As one friend of mine put it when he was working on the seventh floor of WHO, he said to me, Richard, WHO is a member state organization, but understand what that means. The United States, its government, its foundations, its private sector pay the biggest part of WHO's budget. So why are you surprised that WHO dances to the song of the highest bidder? Why are you surprised that WHO is nothing more than the unofficial wing of the US State Department? Global health has evolved into this curious creature. It is an instrument creating a new era of scientific, programmatic, and policy colonialism, where those who claim, those who claim the right to study, to speak, to argue, to publish, to perform, and to judge other countries, and who now are politely called partners, where they are part of an apparatus of power, of self-interest and control that denies justice and denies equity to billions of people worldwide. Today is your chance. Stand up. Speak out. End this charade. Stop it. Vote for this motion. Nelson, please make your case. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure what has excited you. <laughs> you have been taken astray, and you haven't followed what this is all about. The statement is global health investments benefit countries in the global north more than those in the global south. They benefit countries, not institutions. That's not what we're talking about. Not individuals, but countries. I think you should vote against this motion in my favor. This is one of the most ridiculous statements that they have put on the table that I've seen in the last decade or two. <laughs> Let's first understand what global health is all about. Global health investments are made with the ultimate purpose. What is the ultimate purpose? The ultimate purpose is to improve survival, people's livelihood, to reduce morbidity, reduce disability, and also improve in the long term outcomes that are relevant to human development. That's what global health is about. And if that's what it's about, we should look at the benefits along those lines. Investments are not made simply to increase people's publications, as appear in the Lancet, or to work towards our promotions in the universities, but to work for the people, the people out there. And when we talk about investments, it's not simply the governments or the funders or foundations, but it is also you and me. We are spending our time and energy. Some of us have traveled thousands of miles to come here. We are investing. And why are we investing in order to improve the lives of people? Low and, middle country, low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected. Of course, there are also pockets in the high income countries. If you are here, and if you are engaging in global health, because you expect a publication, a promotion, to strengthen your center for global health, 
research at your institution, you are in the wrong place. And so, when we look at benefits, we must look at them differently. As the statement says, benefit countries. A country has a population, a country has infrastructure, and a country has social services and other services. How are we benefiting in that direction? They are relevant questions to consider. What do you consider as benefits? Who defines them? We in the South must participate in the, in the definition of benefits accruing from global health. And those are the benefits that concern us. Not your benefits, for those of you who are in the North. They must be our benefits. Over what period of time? Are we talking in the immediate because we have set up, we have set up centers of global health? Or are we looking in the long term? When many people are obsessed with the short term, Benefits, for many of us, we are looking over the horizon into the future. And those are the benefits we are looking at. We have innovations in the global south. Innovations accruing from investments in global health. For example, we have community health workers delivering services and making a difference. The use of mobile phones making a difference to people's lives. The kind of innovations in global health that the global health just disregards, that they are irrelevant to them. Call them irrelevant, for us we are on the move. And the benefits are right there. Low-cost technology for delivering various healthcare delivery services. How do we measure benefits? The South again, has to participate in the definition of these benefits and how they are measured. Benefits must be measured relative to the needs of the country. They must be measured relative to the best figures. I did not hear one piece about the best figures, about the needs of the country in Richard Horton's discussion. We when we talk about benefits, they must be relative to these. And when you do that, you come to very interesting results. For example, in our countries, we were being decimated by, by HIV and AIDS. And the innovations and investments into global health have made a difference. We walk around with a smile. Our survival has been improved. The quality of life has remarkably improved. Those are investments in global health. The global north may monopolize some of those benefits for a while. When we do not access antiretrovirals, and sooner or later we get them and we enjoy them. Investments in global health are benefiting the global south. So, in the end, we have added life to years. And we are adding years to life. Take the issue of maternal and child mortality. Yes, the numbers are not where the targets were intended with the MDG. But surely there has been a marked improvement, marked reductions in the unfavorable figures. As I come to the end, let me say, global health is like smoking. <laughs> in case you hadn't thought about it, it is like smoking. Whether you are an active smoker, or someone else who doesn't take the cigarette, or whatever it is, and you are around smokers, the concept of passive smoking is well known. Even passive smokers reap from the effects of smoking. <laughs> Global health is in that situation. <laughs> that is what is happening. So whether the resources are sitting in Washington, 
whether the resources are sitting in New York or London, like passive smoking, we get the benefits in the long run. <laughs> These are comments from a man who lives in the South and every day touches the benefits, every day smells the benefits, every day sees the benefits, and you cannot argue against that experience. You should vote against the motion. Richard, I think you have been really put into question in a very offensive way. You have the right <laughs> to respond very briefly. <laughs> Not more. <laughs> good try, good try. <laughs> Three brief additional pieces of evidence. Nelson says that global health is about working for the people. Who is global health really for? It's for an increasingly toxic network of sinister alliances. <laughs> Let me tell you one example. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. Go to their website now on your browsers and look up their partners and there you will get a sense of just who we are colluding with. Chevron, a super major oil company guilty of environmental damage in Ecuador, oil spills in Angola and Rio, shootings in Nigeria, destruction of forests in Bangladesh, repression of environmentalists in Argentina, Coca-Cola fueling a global epidemic of NCDs. Fail. A mining multinational voted the world's worst company in 2012. Those are the friends of the Global Fund. Those are the friends of global health. Nelson says that the benefits must be measured according to the needs of the, of, of the something I can't read in my notes. <laughs> of the country, of the country. We have much to be thankful for in having the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'll be the first on the front line defending them. But in the only independent analysis of Global Fund of, of the Gates Foundation grant making, over 80% of their grants went to institutions in the United States. It's global health for the global north. Fantastic institutions, every one of them. But is that really the best we can do? Nelson also asked, who defines the benefits? Well, let me tell you with an example. I was at the back of an elevator in the Millennium Plaza Hotel at the UN General Assembly a few years ago, and in walks the United Kingdom Minister for International Development. And to cut a short conversation even shorter, this is what he said. The United Kingdom Foreign Office, your State Department equivalent, sets the foreign policy of the UK. The Department for International Development and Global Health delivers that foreign policy. We are merely a pawn in the G7 NATO and Security Council geopolitics. So friends, how much evidence do you need? Global Health, the lap dog of the geopolitically powerful, global health. <laughs> a foreign policy instrument of rich nations, global health, a means to launder the reputations of dubious multinationals, global health, an exclusively high-income country discipline, global health, the new colonialism, and global health, a vehicle for the already powerful high-income country universities to strengthen their brands, their reputations, and their revenues. Shame on you. I began... <laughs> I began by imploring you not to vote for me or for this proposition, but now I have to ask you, how can you not? No, 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 this is unbearable. I, I give you two minutes to respond. I mean, you have to. Please do something. Stop him. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a total embarrassment. <laughs> that the man we entrust to take care of global health issues through his publication, The Lancet, is misrepresenting information this morning. We need the proper indicators for the benefits. I emphasize, we need the right indicators for benefits. 
not the immediate stuff that he's talking about. What are these benefits? They are intangibles, for example, that we haven't discussed. There are benefits that many people don't even feel in the global north. Take the issue of ownership. Ownership of programs and projects. The global south increasingly is taking ownership and taking charge. And while you, many people in the global north preoccupy themselves with what they seem to see, they don't see us. They don't appreciate that we're taking ownership and beginning to dictate what we would like to see. Because the global north realizes that the global south is benefiting tremendously from global health investments, they now begin to talk of reverse innovations in the sense that, oh, look, we must learn from the south. They used to talk about knowledge from in, uh, flowing from the north to the south. Now they are saying there are many things happening there. We must learn from those innovations in the south, how they are making a difference, and we bring them to the northern hemisphere. Ladies and gentlemen, to me, the debate is straightforward. <laughs> and you know who to vote for. Remember where we started from. If I have money to sway many more voters to my side, that is success. <laughs> I, I will take two questions from statements from the audience. They have to be no longer than one minute long. One has to be supporting Nelson, and the other one has to be supporting Richard. And so a statement supporting Nelson. I think you need some support there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Who is stepping forward? Yes? Or, or statement in support of, uh, of Nelson. I'm very curious about you saying that there are technologies that are coming from the south to the north. Um, I'm curious what are some of these examples? Because if this is true, then that is the, I think, biggest uh, support for, for that side right now. Yeah, you want to give an example? You can. Mm -hmm. Technologies are not just machines. Technologies are more than machines. And we, by using the kind of health workers, like community health workers, that is a technology. And you are beginning to appreciate in the North that using people who are at a lower level but can do the job and do it efficiently and properly, that you can borrow from that lesson. We've done a lot in HIV in terms of counseling and testing, and I think lessons which the North has taken on. One question for uh, Richard, or one statement. Pete. One question there. So I wanted to ask you about PEPFAR, for example, a program that gives a ton of money for global AIDS relief, but does so, for example, with um, the, the, the necessity that almost also must accompany with it um, um, sorry, abstinence-only education to countries that accept PEPFAR aid. I was wondering if compromises like this you think might be necessary, however, to provide some benefit to the receiving country. Never. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
a, la a last question also in support of Richard because he needs a lot of support uh, here after, <laughs> after that answer. I, uh, uh, I absolutely <laughs> agree. I'm Kamaini from India. I would just like to add that in our country, uh, besides Chevron and the Coca-Cola, I would like to say Vedanta and all the private sectors are actually approaching the health arena and taking away what is there with us. And we are being used in South, I feel, a lot like guinea pigs for the clinical trials. All right. Well, thank you very much to uh, uh, Nelson and to Richard. Now we have to vote again. And under Belgian law, if you don't vote this time, you have to pay 200 euros again. <laughs> so, in favor of Nelson. Ah, oh, that's a big improvement from, from the pre-post. The pre in favor of Richard. Ah. It's kind of even now. <laughs> From a Belgian perspective, we like that. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Abstentions. Okay. And persons who do, who do not want to vote? No? Oh, one? Oh, no, nobody. All right. Well, this was a fantastic debate. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you.